when John talked about uh, roundheads and cavaliers, he really meant wide boys, and I think the cavaliers would be the arrogant middle classes. A lot of paleontologists are making a lot of noise about protecting fossils. And I think it's an arrogance. I think that they are selfish. I think that they're probably spoiled white middle classes on the whole. I've given it a lot of thought. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I used to love collecting. How many of you like collecting? Just really like collecting things. I mean, it might be tourist spoons. There's little spoons. You can get those in England. It might be tea towels of tourist places. It coins. Anybody collect coins? Stamps? Do you remember when people collected stamps? How many of you would dare to confess to when you were young, and it'll only be the older members of the audience, to collecting bird's eggs? Anybody dare confess? Unwin, you cretty. <laughs> Martin. You cretty. I also did. I also collected birds. I can understand why we want to conserve nature, living things. I can absolutely see the sense of it. Fossils are already dead, aren't they? I mean, you can serve them fair dues. But fossils are in the ground. And fossils in the ground aren't much use to anybody. So paleontologists can only work on fossils if they're out of the ground. And so, all that I'm going to say today is about fossils that are in the ground. There's lots and lots of legislation about fossils that are in collections and moving fossils across boundaries, but my real worry, my real concern is that blanket legislation, legislation that is knee-jerk legislation, because some beautiful big Tarbosaurus appeared at an auction house in New York, blanket legislation that is introduced to stop fossil collecting is stopping a lot of young people who love collecting, a lot of scientists who like collecting, it stops people getting the fossils that we need for paleontology. And so I have a completely laissez-faire attitude to legislation, fossils that are in the ground. I say don't do it. Don't have any legislation for fossils that are in the ground. Have some legislation for some specific and sensitive sites. And even with those sites, you should be circumspect about why you're preserving that specific site. That site could be worth preserving because it shows a beautiful animal in the ground and there's only one of them. Okay, hammers off, no collecting. On the other hand, there are some sites that are worth preserving because they've got lots of fossils and the fossils there are accessible, but hey, have a collecting policy. Let people come and collect, limit the numbers that they collect. But don't, for heaven's sakes, have a blanket ban, like many countries do, that prevent people from collecting fossils. And so what I want to do is try to demonstrate that when we're protecting the fossils that are in the ground, we're actually doing a disservice. And also that these laws actually, they affect the science of paleontology, but they don't affect other people. They're kind of discriminatory. They stop us collecting our fossils, and yet other people are allowed to just destroy. You see this, this, uh, uh, Kultusch, what is called? Kultusch, it's Gesetz, Dino, say that for me, it's, it's got too many words, uh, the Cultural Property Protection Law that's just coming in Germany. I was really surprised, I always thought the Germans were a little more enlightened, but I do believe that uh, this law has got some little loopholes that we can jump through. And as John showed this morning, there are lots and lots of, if you like, ambiguous terms in legislation, which if you could afford good lawyers, you'll be able to get through finding lots and lots of loopholes. So some of the very rich collectors uh, who might be breaking the law will probably find that they won't get prosecuted, whereas lowly souls like me with barely two pennies to scratch together will probably get prosecuted, although I've done quite well so far. So, um, Museum Sonhofen has just fallen foul of the introduction of this law. Um, super place, if you've not been, do, do go to Museum Solhoven. Isn't this absolutely gorgeous, isn't it? I mean, this is one of these specimens that just makes you want to go out and be a fossil collector. Uh, Aspidorhynchus uh, embroiled somehow with Aramphorhynchus. Uh, and there's a beautiful story to be told. This 
specimen was on uh, show, was on display in that museum for uh, at least three years and I used to take my students there and I was rather disappointed to see that the specimen has been withdrawn now because the owner is desperately worried that this specimen may be confiscated. So, we've seen the Posidonia shell, we've seen some ichthyosaurs, let's destroy some. It's a great pastime. Here we go. There's a cement works in Dottenhausen, just south of Tübingen. And they quarry an oil shale to provide the silicate for cement manufacture. But this man, with this drill machine, blasting the face, he hasn't broken the law in any way, shape or form, but he's probably destroyed in that length of outcrop five or six complete stent ridges. The odd crocodile, um, lots of fish, millions of ammonites, and if you go after a blast, and I take my students every year, and we pull out ichthyosaurs from this quarry, but broken, blasted ichthyosaurs. I mean, why are we, why are we using this rock when it's a fossil larger statin? Why aren't we clearing a field of this and excavating it? But no, we choose to blast these fossils to pieces. More or less once a week. Before the recession hit a few years ago, probably two or three times a week, there was a blast destroying all those ichthyosaurs. And all we can do is pick up the broken bits and pieces and hopefully we'll find something of interest. There you go. This man's not breaking the law either. He's taking broken ichthyosaurs and he's smashing them up and bruising them around a little bit. And uh, this man, he's not breaking the law either. He's crushing those little bits of ichthyosaur into four centimetre size pieces and they're going to be crushed and made into cement. So you're absolutely allowed to smash as many fossils. You can dig up whole fossil lagerstätte data and put them through crushes. Okay, he's grinding one to four by four centimetres pieces. These are my students. They're rescuing ichthyosaurs. There's a bandit, there's a thief, there's a hardened criminal. Dodgy, dodgy people. All enthusiastic paleontologists, hopefully with a bright future. They've all just passed their exams, all of them. So, <laughs> they're criminalising us. Some of you in the audience uh, will know Steve Etches. Some of you will have heard of Steve Etches. Steve Etches is an amateur collector, an absolute enthusiast for collecting fossils. He is a man obsessed, as we all are. I mean, there is an element of nerdiness, isn't there, in poetry? Hands up if you consider yourself to be a bit of a nerd. It is trendy these days. Come on. I mean, we actually are quite weird, really, aren't we? So, uh, Steve has dedicated 30 years of his life, maybe, maybe a little more now, 30 years, to collecting from the Kimmeridge Clay Formation, Upper Jurassic Formation, and he's built up a beautiful collection. Not only has he dedicated 30 years of his life to collecting, he's also an incredibly skilled preparator. He's also read all the literature. He also documents where all of his fossils come from. He knows the Kimmeridge Clay better than any professional geologist or professional paleontologist in the UK, damn it, in the world. Oil companies go to look at the Kimmeridge clay and he takes them out on field work. He also wanted his collection to, if you like, go into the public domain. He had some issues about donating it to, say, the Natural History Museum. No offence to anybody here from the Natural History Museum. Oh, except Paul Barry. Lots of offence to Paul Barry. Right? Um, he had some issues about how they look after material. The thing is that Steve has got incredibly high standards and loves individually every specimen he collected. So although the data's on the database, it's also in his head. They're all personally loved. And I'm sure that some of you can actually understand where that comes from. It's beautiful to make a discovery, it's beautiful to find something fascinating, it's beautiful to prepare it and see it revealed. You can understand how it becomes an object of desire, something that's nice to possess and own. But this collection is important as an entire collection. There isn't another collection in the whole of the UK 
as good or as diverse for any other formation, I don't think. So he actually put an awful lot of his effort into establishing a trust and getting a museum built. Hands up here, who as an individual has actually got a museum built. Oh, well done, that man. <laughs> you did, you did. And you fit into the same category as Steve Etches. You are the same sort of person. The passion that makes you want to dedicate your life to paleontology. And you did as well. Yeah, you did. Well done, yeah. Well done. I've never done that. But he raised six million. Six million. He found enough people to put six million into building a museum dedicated to this formation, the fossils of this formation. His collection at the moment is still in this rather small room, but the museum has been built and it will open in September and you will get an invite, maybe not next year, but probably the year after, we will try and have this meeting over there. Oh, <laughs> but there might be some issues getting through customs. <laughs> So there's the collection. The fossils are truly beautiful. In, in fact, stunning. Exceptionally so. And exceptionally well preserved. And that's, well, the museum does actually look like that, but that's off of the architect's um, pad. And it's all singing and dancing inside. Brazil. This is a place that's also got some beautiful fossils and it has some laws to protect them. But Brazilians don't mind multinational gypsum mining companies. I think this is either Holcim or Lafarge. That'd be French. Yeah? Lafarge is French. That'd be you, Eric. Holcim is Swiss. Yeah. Is it? I can't make my pointer work. That's the Santana formation. So what you are allowed to do in Brazil is you're allowed to destroy a fossil lagerstatten and all the nodules with all the pterosaurs and all the fishes and all the other beautiful things in there with their soft tissue preservation and just shovel it away just to get it a bit of gypsum. But you try going there and collecting a few fossils, you, well, you upset a few people. Fossils from the Santana Function and the Crater Formation underneath are absolutely gorgeous looking. And I know it's not a vertebrate, but it might as well be. It's got big eyes. <laughs> and some of them are really pretty, pretty important. Although one-offs. <laughs> you notice this. that the snake at the top's not got legs. And this poor man, this poor man, good friend of mine, this poor man ended up in jail. Ended up in jail. So he's Brazil's, one of Brazil's top professional vertebrate paleontologists, professional academic scientific. And because some laws said that he couldn't have fossils, he got stopped getting onto an aeroplane with some fossils. And, I mean, if anybody's going to be legitimately collecting fossils in Brazil, it's got to be this man. And he ends up in jail. Okay, a misunderstanding. But how many of you fancy a couple of days in a Brazilian jail? <laughs> no, nah, no hands now. Um, I'm going to skip her because, yeah... I'm going to skip that. Um, I think that there's a little bit of a haul of the fossils that they got there. These fossils are worthless. Worthless. Once you go to jail for a bunch of worthless fossils like that. I'd go to jail for that one, though. Wouldn't you go to jail for that one? A couple of days? A couple of days in jail for that one? I'd do a week for that. Morocco. How many people have bought a fossil from Morocco? Who's got a trilobite, polished off conic nautiloid, shark's tooth? Complete tethysaur, pliosaur, dinosaur. Oh, stunning. If it were not for commercial fossil dealers, you would never see fossils like that. None of you have got the time to prep that. None of you would justify your preparators spending the time to prep that. But wages are low in the Sahara Desert, and prepping that and selling it actually makes you more money than herding your goats. It's not exploiting the natives, not at all. A commercial market in fossils provides these people with genuine work. There's more than a thousand families are employed in their food preparing fossils, and a whole load more in Al Nif and various other places. 
Everybody's seen those. They're all over the world. The outcrop of this rock extends for hundreds of kilometres. We are not going to run out of that. So a blanket ban in Morocco would be devastating for people. <laughs> Although we could do without some of the things. But that's the matter of taste and not ethics. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the phosphates. So some of you will have probably got a piece of Mosasaur jaw. How many people have a piece of Mosasaur jaw like that? <laughs> so here's a little story. So I go around my mate's house because he's not long got married and he's moved into a new house and he's having this party. We call them housewarming parties, yeah? And you go along and you take some drink. And I was going up to him and I said, Mike, Bloody hell, you've got one of those fake Moroccan Mosasaurs. And his wife says, I bought that as his wedding present. <laughs> so, that one's genuine, and there's nothing fake about those. The teeth are all genuine, the bones are all genuine, they're just not from the same animal. But they do enthuse children, and for a few euros, they're not very expensive, what a thrill to have something like that. These, these fossils have just been rescued from the rubbish. That's not rubbish. Isn't that beautiful? These are not rare in the Moroccan phosphates. They really are not rare. And shark's teeth aren't very rare either. You can get billions of them. And that is the phosphate. If you stop people collecting in those phosphate mines, all that is happening, all that is happening is these fabulous fossils are being destroyed by their billions. By their billions. And this is what is happening all the time. Fossils are being destroyed in mines, and those countries that have laws that stop you collecting fossils, I mean, they are just turning a blind eye to something where scientists would say, please, can I just spend 10 days in there rescuing fossils? I mean, what's the point? This is also in Morocco. This is in a place called Asla. And uh, this is... All of, this, all of this mining is just for fossils. And this is where the beautiful ammonites come from. If it were not for this mine, this village would be dead. There is no work for the locals other than digging these fossils. And these, these people, they are the happiest people I am. They are absolutely superb. And I go there with my students every year. And sometimes we'll find, we'll go into one of their mines. Um, sorry if that's a bit, bit bright. Um, they, they use mirrors to guide their way to make the mine. There we go, they, they mine down the beam of light and then they can see the fossils that they're finding as they go down in a cool way, very simple, just a little bit of broken mirror there. And um, they'll find fossils for you and they'll cook you dinner for you. That's really good. And if, if you find a fossil in the mine, you go, oh look, there's an ammonite, they'll dig it out for you and they'll give it to you and you say, how much? And they go, well, no, you found that. Isn't that nice? Uh, isn't that genuinely nice? There's no mafia there. There's no mafia. These people aren't being exploited. What they've done is they've found that they can make a decent living collecting fossils. You bring in a law, and Morocco is considering it. I've got a meeting in November. I'm going to give a similar talk. These people will be out of work. They will have to go to the big city. They'll have to go to Casablanca. They'll have to go to Rabat. And those cities are already pretty full. And all of these fossils, they're for sale at really good prices. There are high prices in the European shops. But hey, why don't you go on holiday to Morocco and go and buy some yourself and get a, get a real good bargain. So, here's a lawbreaker. I model myself on this man. I model myself on this man. Um, he used to get bodies from graveyards to learn anatomy. So all of you who have had an operation where a surgeon has cut you open, actually, historically, it goes back to people like him who wrote the textbooks for surgery before he got really heavy into paleontology from stealing bodies. That's always been illegal. But he realised that he wasn't going to progress his science unless he actually got the material. And I think the same. I think the same. If we're going to progress in our science, we've got to get the material. So I'm asking you all to behave very unethically. So go and snatch a body. <laughs> if we People donate them now. Go snatch a fossil. Washington Basin, southern Wyoming, USA. There we go. Bill Turnbull, very famous mammologist, was. Well, still is famous, but sadly no longer with us. Um, 
as I said down there, Bill was a hell of a nice guy, but a habitual rule breaker. Absolutely a habitual rule breaker. He'd go onto BLM land and steal the fossils. Why? Because he was always working on last year's permit. The bureaucracy was so slow that he never ever had the permit in time for the field season. It was also theoretically illegal. And then there's Mary Annie. We've already heard Mary Annie. Thank you. Mary Annie was a filthy, stinking fossil dealer, a selfishly pillaging Britain's paleontological heritage for profit. Profit making money. A love of money, as Norell said. Oh, I got it mixed up. She was actually one of the ten most influential women in 19th century science. A shining light for women wanting to get into STEM subjects. Yeah. So all you ladies in the audience, if it were not for Mary Annie. So we actually have Mary Annie as an icon. An icon. But, oh yeah, she was a commercial fossil dealer. If there was a law there stopping her, because she was a poor lady, she would be behind bars. Without a doubt. And look what she got. Dimorphodon. Plesiosaurs. <laughs> she was a pioneer. And all of these people, Dean William Buckland, he was buying the fossils off of her. He had no problem with buying fossils. Gideon Mantell, he bought fossils, he collected fossils, he sold his collection. Dealer. And Alfred Leeds sold two collections. That's Jeff's hero. Jeff, isn't that your hero? Hmm? One minute. This is an hour talk, which I gave at Leicester in an hour and a half, compressed into 30. I have a lot more ranting still to do. <laughs> so I'm actually going to say that if a country has some laws, please, for the sake of science, go ahead and break them. Go ahead and break those laws. <laughs> Thank you.